Good morning, everyone. My name is Mira Siveling. I'm one of the first year fellows here at Wells, and I'll be doing imaging conference this morning. I'll get us started here. Our first case is a 55-year-old female who was referred for sudden vision loss in the right eye for one day. Dr. Shalai, would you mind walking us through what you see here? Definitely. We have a color fundus photo of the right eye. Uh, it is a montage image here. Uh, central acuity is profoundly declined at counting fingers. Media appears clear. Uh, we have a relatively large disc here. The cup looks normal, uh, relatively healthy rims here. The nasal aspect of it is not as well defined, but the temporal aspect is sharp, no disc hemorrhages. There's a temporal crescent here. Uh, looking into the vasculature, there appears to be some hypopigmented changes uh, surrounding or maybe inside, I want to say predominantly the veins here, some in the superior arcade, inferior arcade, even here supranasally as well. Looking at the arteries, I don't see quite such a profound amount of lesions. Maybe some here, uh, hard to tell. Uh, no emboli that I can appreciate. Uh, no retinal hemorrhages, and drawing our attention to the central macula, we see some what appears to be retinal whitening in both the superior and inferior macula, and then this um, change or a difference between the appearance of the fovea and the surrounding uh, macula, more dark appearance here, and the surrounding whitening that we see around the fovea. Thank you. Yep. So on clinical exam, it was definitely noted to have asymmetric involvement, more so the veins um, than the arteries. And then we have the left eye here. So Kyler found this photo of the left eye. Central acuity is intact. Again, a large disc, uh, normal cup, healthy rims. Um, we don't really appreciate as much of a change uh, surrounding the vasculature here. Um, I don't know if this is true, but there appears to be some hypopigmentation here on the superior uh, arcade, again, around the veins. Um, no obvious evidence of uh, tortuosity or retinal hemorrhage, and the arteries look okay here. No evidence of the retinal whitening. Excellent. So we have a horizontal uh, OCT through the fovea of the right eye. On the infrared image, we appreciate these uh, darker darker areas corresponding to the areas of retinal whitening. It's interesting, it has a more confluent appearance in the inferior macula, and then in the superior macula, more of a, a blotchy, kind of non-confluent appearance um, that we see. Going over to the actual B scan, uh, the vitreous is optically clear, the hyaloid appears to be attached, the choroid seems to have normal architecture to it, our, and our attention is drawn to specifically the inner retinal laminations, which seem to have some accentuated hyperreflectivity associated with them, and there's loss of definition of the inner retinal laminations. Um, also interesting, there does appear to be maybe some columns which are spared, which correspond to the infrared image having this blotchy appearance. Um, thinking of paracentral acute middle maculopathy lesions and this quote-unquote fern-like appearance is more characteristic when there's venular involvement, though these more confluent lesions are more arterial. And here we have a vertical cut kind of showing that difference between the uh, what appears to be inferior and superior macula, more uh, confluent, dense, more hyper reflectivity that we see on, on the inferior aspect of the macula compared to the superior. The outer retinal laminations look relatively intact. Horizontal uh, B scan through the left fovea. Infrared image has more of a normal appearance on this side. And uh, regarding the retinal laminations, we don't appreciate any abnormal um, hyper or hypo reflectivity. Outer retinal laminations also appear normal, as does the choroid and uh, the vitreous cavity. So, you know, we obviously have 
some type of retinal vasculitis, more so involving the veins than the arteries and what appears to be an arterial occlusion. What types of things are going through your head in terms of a differential diagnosis for this patient? And how do you kind of break this up and think about it? Yeah, so we have an older patient, um, sudden vision loss, it seems like. There's evidence of uh, retinal ischemia, especially inner retinal ischemia, as well as um, vascular involvement vasculopathy, vasculitis, maybe perivasculitis, predominantly affecting the veins. Um, in, an, in a setting of acute vision loss in an older patient, I want to make sure I don't miss any um, occlusive etiologies for this patient, even though the veins seem to be predominantly involved. So uh, I would, this is a patient I would check the blood pressure on. Um, I would check the pulse rate, make sure it's regular, and I would do uh, a neurologic workup and cardiac, cardiac evaluation for this patient. Thinking of other buckets of etiologies, um, infectious causes that could do this and affect um, the vasculature, uh, viral etiologies, CMV and HIV are the viral causes that could predominantly affect the veins. Uh, things like TB and toxoplasmosis cause more of a mixed pattern of involvement. Um, and then syphilis and Lyme disease can also affect the vasculature, though I think they tend to have a mixed appearance as well. Um, thinking of inflammatory causes, uh, things like sarcoidosis uh, predominantly affect the veins. Uh, whenever I think about sarcoidosis, I think about tattoo-associated uveitis, which could has, have uh, common um, findings. In addition to that, uh, systemic autoimmune conditions like inflammatory bowel disease or multiple sclerosis could involve retinal vasculature, um, as well as things like uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome um, and lupus. Those, those tend to predominantly affect the arteries, but can affect the veins as well. Um, in addition, Bichette's disease could also have more of a mixed appearance, so I would inquire about that in the patient's history. Yeah, excellent. I totally agree. Obviously, in someone, you know, she's a 55-year-old female, African-American, um, so kind of right on the borderline for a female to worry about GCA. Um, so you always want to think about, you know, cardioembolic etiologies as well as um, inflammatory etiologies. And then just thinking about, you know, res retinal vasculitis, differential diagnosis, you kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of dividing it up into you know, phlebitis versus mix versus arteritis, um, and, you know, sarcoid, CMV, HIV, just like you said, we're higher on our differential diagnosis. Um, MS can also manifest like this as well. Um, so, you know, thinking about this, you know, what is the mechanism of this central retinal artery occlusion? Um, is this an occlusive arteritis or a periphlebitis that's causing arterial occlusion? Um, or is this, you know, an independent thromboembolic event in the setting of um, some ongoing um, venous inflammation? Um, so we sent the patient to the Will's Eye emergency room for um, neuroimaging and neurology evaluation. Um, he had an MRI, she had an MRI brain, um, MRI head and neck, as well as a, a cardiac echo lower extremity ultrasound as well. Those were all normal. Um, she did have a chest x-ray that showed a small granuloma. Um, so she had a chest CT to follow up on that, which showed four um, small pulmonary nodules with benign features, but no interstitial lung disease, no um, fulminant hyaluronopathy. Um, her inner chest abdomen and pelvis was within normal limits. So Mira, when you send them to the Wills ER, this is for like a stroke workup. Stroke so, workup, yeah. yeah. And you send them to the stroke team? So they come into the ER, um, and then we have the neurology team come and evaluate them. And typically, these patients are admitted um, for a full um, cardiac and neurologic evaluation, MRI, um, echo. Um, and then oftentimes, these patients are discharged home with cardiology follow-up um, just to make sure they don't have any underlying um, arrhythmia that's causing this. Obviously, her case is a little bit atypical because um, she does have this inflammatory component. There was also a concern that there, you know, we wanted to rule out any CNS and vasculitis in this case as well as cardioembolic. Uh, 
One uh, of the unusual things about our institution is that the Will's Eye ER is in the neuroscience hospital. And so it's sort of, they're all in the same place, which makes it convenient, which may not be the case in other institutions. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious if, you know, we were at other institutions, I think, you know, in the setting of an acute artery occlusion, and there's been kind of more recent publications on this, you know, now we um, have a lower threshold to send these patients directly to um, an emergency room. Um, we are very lucky that we kind of have a team who's used to this. Um, but I'm curious in the community, you know, with your other colleagues, do you find that um, they are sending these directly to an emergency room? Um, or is this more of an outpatient, you know, follow up with your cardiologist type of situation? So I think in the past 10 years, that's changed dramatically. And yeah. the standard of care now is to send to a stroke center. And I think it's, you know, it's instructive to us. We have offices, you know, pretty far away from Center City, Philadelphia. And just because it's a fairly large hospital doesn't mean it's a stroke center. And so it's worthwhile kind of identifying those places ahead of time because when the patient comes in, it's sort of helpful to triage them. But it's also sort of sobering when you call the ERs. Some ERs sort of understand that, you know, this is definitely a cerebrovascular event. We'll treat it as such. But some places are still like, well, it's just the eyeball of that mentality. It's still lingering in the community to some degree, even in places that should know better. So she did have an extensive laboratory workup, um, including basic C CBC, CMP. Um, interestingly, her ANA was slightly elevated. Um, her ACE was elevated at 69. The reference, I believe, was 50. Um, CRP was normal. ESR was mildly elevated um, for age and gender adjustment. Um, but the rest of her workup was negative. So in terms of initial treatment, um, you know, it was thought that, um, you know, some type of inflammatory um, or autoimmune condition was going on. So she was started on IV solumedrol, 250 milligrams, Q6 for three days, and then discharged home on oral prednisone. Um, and here we have an image of her at two-week follow-up. Um, with a wide-field pseudocolor fundus photo of the right eye. Um, and here we can see, <clears throat> you know, further out into the periphery, um, persistent um, perivenular involvement. And then here out in the periphery, you can see these more kind of chronic um, hyperpigmented changes to suggest that, you know, this has been going on um, for some time. Um, and then, Hard to say for sure, but maybe some mild improvement of the retinal whitening two weeks later, persistently um, profoundly decreased vision in the right eye. And then here in the left eye, vision is still preserved 2020, but again, we have a kind of a wider field showing these peripheral um, pigmentary changes look, appear perivenular. Um, and Dr. Shalai, we have some IVFA images, if you wouldn't mind walking us through this. Yeah, we have a fluorescein angiogram of the right <clears> eye at 25 <throat> seconds. Seems like we're in the arterial phase here. Um, don't see any venous perfusion yet. The arteries seem to be perfusing uh, normally. This fluorescein two weeks later? Two weeks later, yep. And at 31 seconds, uh, it looks like we're in the uh, AV phase. The veins are now completely perfused, and we're starting to see some hyperfluorescence along the uh, veins, uh, temporally here as well as nasally. The disc appears normal. Yep. And uh, further along, we see persistence of these hyperfluorescent changes. Uh, in the areas that were previously noted. Uh, difficult to say, maybe some peripheral non-perfusion here, as well as some foci of hyperfluorescence in the far temporal periphery. No leakage that I can appreciate yet. So again, persistent hyperfluorescence here. Um, and we did have some pigmentary changes associated with these, so they could also be window defects. We didn't have any early frames of them. so either staining or a uh, win window defect uh, on these hyperfluorescent changes. Mm -hmm. And this is 1 minute 53 seconds in the left eye. And uh, we sh appreciate similar uh, hyperfluorescence along just the veins, both nasally and temporally, uh, as well as some 
uh, hypofluorescence, perhaps from blockage from the pigmentary changes. Again, this is something that I would call either staining or window defect based on how it would have looked like early on. Maybe some um, hypoperfusion temporally as well. It's mm -hmm. hard to say. And similar changes here might go back. It looks like even the arteries, I mean, it fills okay, but the periphery, it's almost pruned. It just stops. Yeah, it's hard uh, to say. Go back it's, one more. Yeah. One more. One more. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely some peripheral non-perfusion out in the far temporal periphery. It kind of just cuts off cuts here. Off. and a horizontal B scan through the fovea in the right eye. Uh, compared to what we saw previously, we see some atrophy uh, along the inner retinal layers corresponding to the previous ischemic insult that the patient had and some thinning. The outer retina appears relatively well preserved. Yeah. And those kind of areas of hyperreflectance appear a little bit more confluent Kind of consistent with the timeline that we're seeing her you know our initial images were one day after right after the presumed occlusive event and now we kind of see these um, areas kind of more coalescing and similar appearance here as well and then left eye fairly normal so just to sum up her workup um, her ACE was elevated, um, and we did have those um, small granulomas noted on the CT scan, um, but overall systemic workup um, was unremarkable. Um, so her working diagnosis was either some underlying unknown autoimmune retinal vasculitis versus possible ocular sarcoidosis, although, and Dr. Dunn, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, her, her systemic workup um, was mildly inconclusive. Um, she had no other uh, systemic manifestations of ocular sarcoidosis, and that CT chest showing those small pulmonary nodules with no hyalur um, involvement, um, not super convincing. Right, I agree. Um, you, you can't call it sarcoid. Yeah. As Doug Jabs used to say, this would be sarcoid sin a sarcoid. Um, <laughs> so. ACE is a, is a very non-specific test. I, yeah. I don't think it tells you anything, nor does the chest x-ray. Yeah. Perfect. Now, having said that, sarcoid will sometimes manifest systemically down the road. So I don't usually end up repeating chest x-rays routinely on patients. But in this patient down the road, a year or two years down the road, it'd be interesting to see if anything manifests itself. Do you typically like these patients to follow with rheumatology just for monitoring for any systemic yeah, I think that's symptoms? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable thing, and I, I let them know the things to look for. Perfect. How long did the retinal whitening last? Um, so it was mild. Uh, so we saw her two weeks later. Um, there was some mild retinal whitening, but definitely not um, as profound as initial presentation. Anka was negative. Anka was and, negative. Um, and um, antiphospho lipids were negative. Negative, yeah. I mean, it was clearly more than the central retinal artery. I mean, there was definitely no choroidal flush here. This is like almost, it looks like an ophthalmic artery, posterior ciliary occlusion. I think this patient is going to be at significant risk for neovascular complications. Yeah. How, in, in the, you know, first six months to a year after an occlusion like that, how often do you like to see them in the office to monitor for um, neovascular? I mean, for issues? straight central retinal artery occlusion, I think the risk of neovascularization drops after three to six months, I mean, with reperfusion. Yeah. So if you don't have neovascularization by then. But I think this patient with the severe ischemia, it's going to manifest pretty quickly over the first three, six months. Yeah. yeah, I agree with Carl. The reason I asked about retinal whitening is if the retinal whitening lasts, you know, six weeks to eight weeks, then those patients are still ischemic and they have a very high chance of developing rubiosa and nevascular glaucoma. So that's the key to watch clinically. Uh, but most of the time, the uh, whitening will go away pretty quickly and the AV transit time resolves very quickly. If the AV transit time persists longer for four to six weeks later, then watch out. Mm 
Do you think there's utility in repeating an FA after the initial FA? Um, just... I think clinically you can watch, but especially in the OCT, if there's hyperreflectivity like six weeks later, that's a clue you've got to watch. Okay, perfect. So just briefly for time's sake, um, sarcoidosis is a systemic inflammatory disease that manifests in non-caseating granuloma granulomas. So unknown etiology. Um, the lifetime incidence um, is slightly higher in women than men and slightly higher in African Americans versus Caucasians. Um, the most common manifestations are hyalur adenopathy, pulmonary reticular opacities, um, and it can involve multiple organ systems, including the skin joints and the eyes. Um, this was a retrospective study looking at um, 700 patients with a recent diagnosis of sarcoid and kind of analyzing the other organ involvement. Um, and you can see ocular involvement was present in almost 12% of these patients with a new diagnosis within, within six months um, of sarcoid. Um, interestingly, ocular involvement can develop, like Dr. Dunn said, in the absence of systemic symptoms. And it could be that we are just catching these patients before they manifest their systemic disease. Sarcoid uveitis is one of the most common manifestations of ocular sarcoid. It's generally bilateral, um, and, you, and you can see also other anterior segment involvement, including conjunctival granulomas, episcleritis, and conjunctivitis. Typical features of anterior uveitis secondary to sarcoid include mutton fat KP, kepi or busaca nodules, um, and anterior posterior synechiae. We can see involvement with intermediate uveitis, although this is less common and then we can have posterior involvement like we had in our patient. In terms of vasculitis, um, this is defined as a group of diseases characterized by inflammation of the retinal arter arterioles and veins. Um, and this can occur in isolation or in association with other infectious or inflammatory etiologies. It's typically characterized as sheathing. You can see cotton wool spots, intraretinal hemorrhages, um, like we saw in our patient vascular occlusion and leakage on fluorescein angiogram. Um, this was a retrospective analysis of 56 patients with a diagnosis of retinal vasculitis of, of multiple etiologies um, between 1985 and 2010, um, and they found that neovascularization was more common in occlusive disease versus um, non-occlusive occlusive disease, which is not surprising. Um, this other retrospective cohort study looked at 175 eyes um, with a diagnosis of retinal vasculitis, looking at the rates of ocular complications as well as visual loss. Um, certain um, other compl visual complications that cause visual loss included cataract, epiretinal membrane, and recurrent macular edema. Not surprisingly, patients with relapsing disease um, had a greater risk of vision loss. Um, and they found that patients who were started on systemic immunotherapy had a lower risk of vision loss long term. Um, and similar to what we found in the other study, patients, um, um, they found that 11% of their patients, sorry, 6.3% of their patients had vascular occlusions or evidence of non perfusion. So our patient was eventually tapered off her prednisone. Um, and started on systemic um, immunotherapy with methotrexate, um, initiating at 10 milligrams weekly, and then she was slowly increased to 15 milligrams as in, in addition to folic acid supplementation and 81 milligrams of aspirin. And here we just have a um, sequence of her OCT scans. This was her initial presentation, um, and then two weeks later that we already saw, this was actually her um, a month ago, and you can see this profound retinal thinning um, and atrophy of the inner retinal layers, persistent hand motion vision, no neovascular disease um, has been noted on her exams. Okay, now we have case number two. Um, our second case is a 29-year-old male who was referred for a retinal hemorrhage in his left eye. Dr. Light, would you mind walking us through these images? Sure. So this is a pseudo color wide field image of the right eye. Visual acuity is good, 2020. The media overall looks clear. The disc margins here look nice and sharp. Looks like a normal physiologic cup to disc ratio here. 
The vasculature is of normal course and caliber. Looks like there's good perfusion even out to the far periphery here. The macula is without lesions and the periphery as well without hemorrhages, lesions, pigmentary changes. And in the left eye, mildly decreased vision to 2040. Media again looks overall clear. The disc again looks sharp, normal cup to disc. The vasculature here as well looks pretty good, normal course and caliber out to the periphery. The central macula looks okay. However, there is this obvious pigmentary change and kind of this curvilinear arcuate sort of morphology that extends superiorly through the superior peripapillary area. There may be some associated hemorrhages here. Unclear if there might be one here. It's a little dim, but maybe a little bit of reddening here that could suggest that there's some hemorrhage near the fovea as well. However, the far periphery, again, looks good. No pigmentary or vascular lesions. And a little closer view up of the macula, again, maybe clarifies this a little bit again. These areas still suspicious for hemorrhage here. This area right here, again, there's almost a meniscus or something right there that might be a little bit of hemorrhage. Um, tough to tell if it involves the fovea or just abuts it here. But again, this uh, hypopigmentation and this kind of arcuate curvilinear sort of morphology is uh, demonstrated again. Perfect. The grayish green appearance right there? Yes, correct. It was hard to tell on clinical exam whether this was, it didn't look like fresh hemorrhage, but definitely um, something suspicious um, for hemorrhage versus a membrane. Hmm. Um, and then this appears sub, subretinal or choroidal, this curvilinear hypopigmentation. So this is a wide field autofluorescence of the left eye, again showing that there's marked loss of autofluorescence corresponding to that deep area of hypopigmentation. The borders show some hyper autofluorescence. Uh, again, the fovea looks to be just barely spared here, uh, though this is a slightly abnormal appearance to the autofluorescence that I would expect to see in the central macula. And this is a OCT scan, looks like horizontal raster through the right eye involving the fovea. The Infrared reflectance pattern looks uh, normal, as does the B scan here. Looks like uh, I don't see a PVD in this patient. Hyaloid probably down here. Um, normal uh, contour and inner and outer retinal lamination patterns and preservation of the choroid. In the left eye, however, you can see again in the infrared reflectance pattern. Marked increased reflectance uh, signal in the area of that uh, hypopigmentation, and then some corresponding darkening, some uh, decreased reflectance surrounding it, including in the fovea. And then over on the uh, B scan, inner retina looks good. Uh, however, there's clearly some disruption of some of the photoreceptor uh, outer retinal bands here. Uh, ellipsoid zone is disrupted there. There's some loss of distinction between the uh, ellipsoid and inner digitation zone here, uh, though it looks like in this area the RPE, Brooks membrane, uh, is intact and the choroid looks normal. However, moving slightly superior, now we're involving, uh, again, a horizontal cut, this time involving some of that uh, pigmentary change. You can see, again, inner retina looks pretty well preserved, though the contour has uh, suffered a little bit of some disruption here, uh, likely due to the fact that we see this large area of almost choroidal excavation. Uh, there's clear disruption of the, uh, again, the uh, ellipsoid zone, interdigitation uh, zone, and then there's this hyperreflective to isoreflective sort of material sitting subretinally, unclear if that's hemorrhage versus possibly some sort of a fibrovascular proliferation. And it looks here like Brooks membrane may be compromised. I don't see that it's uh, intact through through here. Uh, an underlying choroid looks like it might be missing or unclear if that's artifact or true disruption there. And then looking at the superior peripapillary area, again, going right through this area of pigment change, um, inner retina, again, 
overall looks preserved. There's very healthy, robust nerve fiber layer here. The inner retinal lamination patterns are intact until we get out to the outer retinal lamination patterns where there's essentially complete loss of the outer retinal uh, layers here. Uh, RPE as well looks completely gone um, from this region here where there's hyper transmittance into the choroid uh, and really no appreciable RPE uh, remaining there. Yep. And then, you know, choroid here looks markedly attenuated mm -hmm. as well. This looks like uh, OCT angiography, again, through that superior peripapillary area, the ONFOS uh, reconstruction here, and then you can see the actual V-scan with the signal. Uh, this appears from the segmentation to be in the avascular complex. Uh, so we would not expect to see uh, much flow signal here aside from some artifact maybe coming from some of the uh, projection from the overlying vessels. Um, I don't see any clear convincing evidence of strong signal coming from any of these subretinal or uh, choroidal or um, this kind of uh, collection of material uh, under the retina and again don't see anything that's convincing for flow signal in this gap um, up here on the onfoss. Perfect. <clears throat> and then looking at, uh, this looks, I'm assuming this is the macular mm -hmm. area that we saw just based on the, morpho the morphology of the flow gap here. Yeah. Um, contrary to the prior image, now we can see in this subretinal material here, there is quite a bit of these yellow dots suggesting flow signal there. And if we look up here, it doesn't look like projection artifact. I would be concerned for uh, neovascularization in this area. Excellent. So we have a unilateral um, peripapillary curvilinear lesion in a young gentleman um, with possible cordial neovascularization. Um, what types of things are running through your mind in terms of a differential diagnosis? Yeah, I mean, I think with that, interesting appearance and loss of RPE and disruption of choroid, um, I would be thinking some traumatic, like a choroidal rupture with secondary um, choroidal neovascularization. Uh, atypical appearance of like a lacquer crack or an angioid streak too with secondary neovascularization uh, would consider. Um, and then just run of the mill myopic degeneration, not sure what his refraction is, but I might wanna just ask that. Um, this would be very atypical for um, like polypoidal or other f forms of neovascularization. Um, and again, given the patient's age, you know, age-related, uh, very unlikely, and there's lack of drusen or other pigmentary changes to suggest that. The only other thing I might think of would be like an inflammatory insult. Again, doesn't look like serpiginous or multifocal, uh, given the lack of other expected findings, but that's another thing that you'd have to consider. Yep. So, you know, certainly in a young male, um, traumatic etiology was high on our differential. I agree, you know, the pattern for angioid streaks or lacquer cracks is not typical um, and inflammatory unlikely as well. So on further questioning, this gentleman reported that he was involved in a motor vehicle accident seven weeks prior to presentation, and he sustained a left orbital floor fracture as well as an upper and lower eyelid laceration that was repaired, as well as a left rib fracture. So the diagnosis of a traumatic um, choroidal rupture with um, choroidal neovascular membrane um, was made. So just briefly about choroidal rupture was first described by von Graef in 1864. And it's characterized by a break in the choroid Brooks membrane as well as the RPE. Um, it's the result of traumatic mechanical, um, a traumatic mechanical event at the site or um, adjacent to the site of the impact. Direct lesions are characterized by um, a lesion at the direct site of the impact, and these are typically found to be peripheral lesions oriented parallel to the aura. Um, whereas indirect lesions, which are more common, 80% of lesions um, are found away from the site of impact, often posterior, and often kind of in this concentric pattern around the optic, optic disc, as we saw in our patient. 
Um, and this is thought to be due to the anterior-posterior deformation of the globe on this traumatic insult, which temporarily expands the eye equatorially when you have the initial insult. And then you have the contra-coup effect of the um, eye um, reforming back, which causes a shearing effect um, in the choroid, um, which ruptures um, the choroid as well as the RP and Brooks membrane. Um, patients with pseudoxanthoma elasticum and Ehlers-Danlos and other underlying connective tissue disorders are obviously at higher risk, um, even in um, episodes of mild um, traumatic events. Um, it is thought that traumatic cordial neovascular membrane can form in 5 to 25% of these patients with significant vision loss. Um, here we have a retrospective review of 111 patients out of Mass Eye and Ear. Um, they uh, looked at visual prognosis, rate of CNVM formation, and retinal detachment after traumatic choroidal rupture. They found that major risk factors for formation of neovascular membrane um, included longer rupture length, um, greater than 2.35 millimeters, location of the rupture within the macula, um, and older age. In terms of poor, vi poor visual outcomes, not surprisingly, foveal location of the initial rupture site, poor baseline visual acuity, and multiple rupture sites. And in their series, they found that CNVM formation occurred between 1 and 18 months after the injury, with a mean formation of 7.75 months. So in terms of treatment, um, you know, before the advent of anti-VEGF, um, we were kind of limited in treating these lesions with laser, PDT, um, and in rare cases, surgery. Um, in our patient, we opted for anti-VEGF treatment. I'm just curious from the attendings, um, you know, in these cases, how do you decide whether to treat or not? Um, is it mainly based on visual acuity or location? Certainly, you know, in the OCTA, uh, in the peripapillary area, we did not see any active um, um, neovascularization, but if you were to have seen something more peripapillary with preservation of visual acuity, would you observe um, or uh, think about treatment? Superior to the nerve, you know, sometimes you may like to watch, but closer to the macula, phobia uh, threatening with subretinal fluid, then you're going to treat these patients. <clears throat> and the real question is, once you start treatment, how often do you treat? Yeah. I think that's dependent on the age and the type of rupture you have, so, and the recurrence rate. The, the, the treatment protocol, you may not need to treat. You may not have to treat as often in, um, in uh, young patients. So you may treat once a month for three months in a row, and then treat and extend for longer periods as time goes on. Yeah, I kind of like see them as like, like a peripapillary membrane that you see where you know, their growth rate isn't impressive. So if they're encroaching the phobia, I, I think you definitely should treat them. But if you see a membrane well outside the phobia, you know, let's say a millimeter or more, I think you can watch them without treatment. You also, uh, you, you also want to see if these membranes are active or not. Here, I'm not 100% convinced. Uh, I think it will depend on the symptomology, uh, whether this patient noticed the recent decline in vision. Uh, I didn't see any exudation or like active fluid on the B scan OCT. And so here maybe like a fluorescein angiogram might help to uh, determine that also. Uh, I think we can be relatively conservative like everyone's been alluding to. And these secondary CNVMs tend to respond to treatment very well. So I don't think they, oftentimes they don't need significant uh, treatment. Yeah, Dr. Benson told me to put observation up there as a treatment option as well. Um, and I agree with Dr. Yonakawa. Uh, I, you know, some of these will persist. I have somebody I take care of who's been had it for like 30 years, and there's definitely a, a CNVM there. You may want to even repeat the OCTA down the road to see if you actually have, have growth here. It's worth a try to see if you can shrink it and make the vision better. But the 2040, so I'm not sure how much better you're going to get. I found this case kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of the literature on choroidal rupture is before we had advanced imaging, and I bet the rates of CMVM might be higher, you know, if we use our current imaging modalities. Uh, we also, you know, traditionally kind of think of it as like a full thickness defect in the choroid, but clearly on your OCTs, you see that the choroid is still there. It's very attenuated, but it's still there. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, you know, and talking to our patient, interestingly, initially after the injury, he didn't notice um, any disruption in his vision. But about two weeks prior to presentation, which is what brought him into the office, he did kind of notice a central defect um, in his vision. So given his symptoms and his reduced visual acuity, we did decide to treat with um, intravitreal Avastin. Um, and here at the top, you can see his initial OCTA on presentation. Um, and then four weeks later, um, kind of a similar cut over the same area, you can see um, some improvement in this um, choroidal lesion here, still with maybe some flow signal here, but certainly less than previously. And then over here in this image, you know, you can, you can see some mild reduction in um, this possible membrane. And then four weeks later, after a second um, Avastin, um, even more significant um, shrinkage of that lesion, um, you know, he, got, he gained one line of um, um, vision, 2040 to 2030. Um, so we are bringing him back in four weeks um, to take a look, repeat OCTA, um, on whether to decide to treat again or not. Following OCTA can sometimes be tricky because here yeah. you see that, uh, I believe that it worked and it's, it's looking great, uh, but the segmentation's a little different mm -hmm. and the location of the B-scan seems to be slightly different to here uh, mm -hmm. yeah but a uh, great job with uh, you know trying to get these images Perfect. 728 should should we move on to the next case Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a quick one. Okay, so our third case is a 74-year-old male who was referred for one month of vision loss in both eyes. Dr. Light. All right, I'll try to just stick to the pertinent things then. Yeah. Um, Finger's vision, right eye, hazy media. Uh, it looks like there's maybe some indistinct lesions here in the macula. If you have a zoomed in image, that'd be helpful. Otherwise, vasculature is a little bit attenuated maybe out here, but again, medial opacity makes it hard to say. Uh, and zooming in, it's almost like this greenish, again, appearance here subfovially, concerning maybe for some hemorrhage or some CNV membrane. And in the left eye, count fingers five feet here, uh, much clearer media, sharp disc, vessels look overall okay. There's some drusenoid speckled changes in the periphery and some drusen here in the macula. This area is a little concerning. That looks like hemorrhage there, and maybe again some subretinal, whether it's proliferation or drusenoid pigment change, a little hard to say just on the pseudo color. And then uh, fluorescein angiography, 31 seconds in the right eye. Again, there's some blurring from the medial opacity here. Uh, looks to be that we're in the venous laminar phase here. Uh, there is decent perfusion out to the periphery. There is mixed hyper and hypofluorescent signal here in the macula, kind of uh, maybe some blockage here in the center in that area that we were discussing before, and then window defect versus early staining out here in the surrounding area. And again, this looks a little bit more prominent now at 40 seconds, uh, full AV phase. Um, some of these areas here almost have kind of a speckled sort of stippled appearance to it. Uh, nothing that looks like obvious leakage at this point. Again, suspect this may be some blockage here. And later frame, uh, one minute, 23 seconds. Similar appearance. Again, I don't see that any of these are clearly leaking, but this stippled sort of appearance here is a little bit. Uh, and I'll any? just note that this varying media appearance, he did have a significant um, um, PSC cataract. So okay. that's the varying media opacity you're and seeing And here this there. looks like maybe some staining, um, whether that looks like a PED or something like that. Um, very hard to tell if there's leakage, just given how degraded the image is. Mm -hmm. And then in the left eye, uh, 1 minute 54 seconds, full AV phase. Again, there's actually kind of a similar appearance here with this central hypofluorescence with this central area of what looks like staining to me and then this kind of stippled rim of hyperfluorescence. Maybe there's a little bit of leakage here, uh, a little hard to tell. 
It looks fairly similar here at two minutes, 21 seconds, not a whole lot of change. And again, there's some staining of these peripheral drusenoid changes. Uh, OCT, uh, intraretinal fluid here, subretinal hyperreflective material here would favor hemorrhage versus fibrovascular proliferation. Looks like it is subretinal because it looks like the RPE is still intact down here. There is relative loss of choriocapillaris, though. These large vessels are present very close up to the uh, RPE here. And then in the left eye, again, intraretinal fluid. This one also has some of the subretinal hyperreflective material. There's some subretinal fluid here, clear PEDs, maybe drusenoid PED here, um, and then disruption of the Brooks membrane, either from artifact or from true disease. And then again, large vessels here are seen very close to the uh, Brooks membrane here. And then OCT angiography, avascular slab. Um, this looks like a pretty clear flow signal in a kind of a branching pattern, suspicious for right on the vascularization. And uh, there's definite signal coming from this you know, subretinal hyperreflective area here uh, adjacent to the subretinal fluid. And again, um, signal present in the avascular slab concerning for probably a neovascular process. So we have a 77-year-old gentleman with bilateral CNVM. What are the biggest things you're worried about in this gentleman? Yeah, so my differential in this guy changes relative to the last case. I'd say uh, age-related macular degeneration is top, given the drusenoid change as well and the patient's age. Yeah. Again, polypoidal is still on the differential myopic, um, but uh, I would be much more inclined to think that this was an age-related process. Yep, exactly. Um, so he, we did diagnose him with wet macular, age-related macular degeneration. Um, we initiated him on anti-VEGF therapy, um, and here you can see um, pre-injection, um, and then four weeks later after Avastin, some mild improvement of the edema um, and mild improvement in his visual acuity, similar findings in the left eye, um, most significantly improvement in the edema um, and mild improvement in the vision. Um, I'll just skip to um, one of my teaching points. You know, obviously we we know we have our tried and true anti-VEGF medications. I, guess I thought I'd just talk briefly about things that are coming down in the pipeline. Ferisimab, which is a bispecific monoclonal antibody that targets ANG2 as as well as an, um, VEGF-A. Um, Avenue Avenue phase two trial was a randomized trial looking at frisimab versus ranibizumab um, over 36 weeks. Um, what they found was that um, frisimab was not superior but not inferior to ranibizumab. Currently, there's a phase three data still pending in the uh, Tanaya and Lucerne trials looking at frisimab at Q8, 10, and 12 weeks versus a flibercept um, at Q8 weeks. And what they've found so far is that 80% of patients um, treated with furosemab were able to go 12 weeks or beyond um, in between treatments. And that's it for today. Just real quick. So, I mean, that, that case, and you went through it, I think it's a great case for, for teaching. Um, there's a, two things that probably you should talk about at yeah. some point. One is the doing one injection versus two injections on the same visit. That's a practical issue that needs to be discussed. Yeah. The second thing you can also talk about is if, if you're gonna choose which eye to treat, which eye to treat and why, and most of us would probably predict the left eye. Yeah. Um, I sometimes will start with the left eye. If the patient's pretty resistant to treatment or skeptical of the treatment and I wanna show them there's gonna be a tangible improvement that will occur, the left eye is gonna get your biggest bang for the buck. But that's, that's the stuff, that bread and butter stuff needs to be discussed. Thank you.